what year this is. This was the new look and it was all the rage and we had uh, this outfit in one of our local downtown women's apparel shops. I'm Nan Geschke and I'm your host of the Los Altos History Show. We have a very special guest with us tonight, Paul Nar Nyberg, who is the publisher of the Los Altos Town Crier. Welcome, Paul. Thank you, Nan. It's good to be here. Oh, thanks for joining us. Uh, this is a very special year for the town crier because they're celebrating their 50th anniversary. Uh, so if we can do our arithmetic, I guess we can say that this was uh, 1947. Um, what kind of world did we live in, Paul? I mean, I was around, I guess you were too, but um, <coughs> uh, what, what was the world like? I know it was a lot different than our world today. Well, it was a post-war world that was, we were just trying to figure out what to do not being at war any longer. The Second World War had ended just a year and a half before this period of time, and uh, changes were coming on very rapidly in 1947. And the research I did, uh, I was 15 years old then, so I remember it vividly in many ways, but things that were happening in the world that I didn't know about, of course. One of them is uh, one of the most significant inventions of perhaps this whole century happened in 1947, and that was the invention of the transistor. And the transistor is the reason we're all here in Silicon Valley. Uh, it's the basis of the, you know, of electronic chips. And also invented that year was something else equally important, especially the people in the kitchen, and that was Tupperware. Transistors Tupperware. and Tupperware were two important inventions. Other things happened in 1947 that it seemed like kind of a blah year, but really a lot happened. For instance, in 1947 was the first year the World Series was televised. It had oh, always been on radio, but 1940, oh, 50 years ago, on television, first year on television. Jackie Robinson signed uh, uh, for professional baseball in that year, the first black person ever signed to a professional baseball contract, a real breakthrough in that era. That was 50 years ago right now. Uh, other things that happened, of course, uh, some famous people were born in 1947, some people you might know about, Hillary Clinton. Oh, that's Elton, right, she just celebrated her 50th birthday. Elton John. Um, Dan Quayle, and uh, a lot of Los Altons were born in 1947. But uh, it, was a, it was an interesting year, and I think what is significant about it, it was uh, that things were exploding everywhere. And we can talk about that. I'll show you some slides in a minute of some of the things that were, were happening in the world. Okay, so before we actually get into those slides, Paul, I just wanted to ask you, you know, in terms of Los Altos, what was Los Altos like? I, I know. Uh, there, were, there, weren't, there still were some lots available here yes. in town. And well, the city, Los Altos, of course, was, was basically a bedroom town then, just as it is today. Mm -hmm. And their main street was developing. There were uh, still a lot of empty lots uh, throughout the, the, the downtown area of what Los El is Los Altos. Orchards were everywhere. There were flower beds in, in lots of, of Los Altos. A lot of cut flowers were grown back in that period of time, and the apricot orchards were, were big. The thing that was most unusual uh, during that time, maybe, was the fact that the town was still served by a train. There were eight trains every day stopped in Los Altos to pick up and deliver passengers, the train station. That was a very important uh, feature of, of the town, wasn't it? Well, it actually... Probably one of the reasons why it grew so quickly. Yes. Well, it's the reason it's here. Uh, Paul Schaup, who was the president of the Southern Pacific Railroad, built a summer home uh, down here on what is now University Avenue. And uh, as a result, I suppose in the early part of the century, this was well before 1947, the early part of the century got tired of 
taking a horse and buggy or whatever to San Francisco to his office. So he had a train spur put down here of the Southern Pacific and a station outside mm -hmm. a block from his house that's still there. Right. And uh, then he bought and got formed a land company to purchase lots or pur purchase the land and divided it and started selling and built, built the community which became Los Altos. And so that was pre-1947. And there, uh, obviously there was a big slowdown in any development all during the war. No cars were manufactured, no, uh, very right. little building materials were available. And so 1947 saw almost a rebirth of, of a city like Los Altos yeah. as well as other, so other communities. So let's look at uh, what okay. our world looked like in 1947, okay. Paul. So uh, let's, uh, let's see uh, if we can bring up that slide. And if you guessed that, uh, that this slide was uh, 1947, you're correct. I guess uh, after we've uh, talked a little bit about this, uh, you could have guessed that by now. In 1947, uh, cars, of course, were being remanufactured, and in, in that's the year that Hertz started renting cars like this. Can you guess what that is? It's a 1947 Studebaker, no longer made, but was very popular. Here's another car that's gone out of, uh, no longer manufactured, the DeSoto, and was very popular along with other Chrysler cars like this Plymouth. And then, of course, the favorite of all of us was this next one, this very sleek Cadillac. Oh, wow, is that a beautiful car? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that style changed uh, a lot, of course, but Cadillacs are still being made. These two gentlemen are sitting way up on top of a Surrey because they had just introduced a new car in 1947 called the Kaiser and Fraser. That's Henry J. Kaiser on the left. He became not only famous not for his cars, which only lasted a short time, but he started Kaiser Cement Company, the Kaiser Permanente Hospitals and Insurance Plan. He had an aluminum company. He was an industrialist who made an incredible impact uh, on our whole nation and really was based here in the Bay Area. Henry J. Kaiser and the man with the top hat is Mr. Fraser. The car in the foreground is, a, is the hood of a Kaiser car or a Fraser. And again, those survived about three years. They really were luxury cars, but they were, were well before their time and were too cheaply made, frankly, to survive very long. And so then they went out of business. Henry J. Kaiser made the aluminum that was used to build these Lockheed Constellations. That was the kind of airplane that was flying in those days, a triple tail a Super G Connie. Oh, and a jukebox. A jukebox. We, we kind of remember eras. You can, you can peg eras by the music and by cars, which is we'll come back to in just a minute. Uh, Moscow in 1947 celebrated its 800th birthday, which means this year they celebrated their 800th, 150. The Clark Bar was big in 1947, the favorite of many people and still is used today. We've included this slide simply to show you what a housewife looked like and what her kitchen was like in 1947, according to this Life magazine ad. And this was her son in his bathroom, <laughs> in wearing his, sailor, his little, in in his little sailor. sailor outfit, which were very popular. Of course, there were radio shows. Television was just getting started in 1947. People like Bob Hope and uh, Fred Allen and, and uh, Jack Benny and so on were very popular in show business. I think we should stop my mate right there, Paul, for a minute. And let's go back to the music because now you said that you know we remember eras by, by the, the music. music and by automobiles and maybe some of the advertisements that are, that are mm -hmm. popular. Uh, what were some of the songs that were popular in 1947? Well, after the war ended, the Second World War ended, people were ecstatic. I mean, there was so much joy and uh, that song that was very popular during the war, uh, There'll Be Bluebirds Over There, White Cliffs of Dover, that oh. was in the, in the early 40s, and that really came true in people's mind. And so we had the Andrews Sisters and Frank uh, uh, Bing Crosby, um, Frankie Lane, we had all kinds of singers like that. Vaughn uh -huh. Monroe had big songs. The most popular song, the biggest song on the hit parade in 1947 was none other than Zippity Doo Dah. Oh, a classic A now. real classic, and it's still around. We still sing it. Another very popular one in 1947 was Open the Door, Richard, an absolutely silly, pointless song, and yet people sang it and enjoyed it. The next year uh, came other, some other songs that we often think about, such as Marzy Dotes and Dozy Dotes. But in 1947, Zippity Doo was, was really the big number. Another one that was, another one of the uh, Andrew sisters did was called Civilization. Bingo, bango, bongo, I don't want to leave the Congo. Congo. <laughs> it, was a, it was a big hit. 
Oh, that's really interesting. Now, I know that uh, you, uh, along with History House, uh, just um, celebrated a, a party about three, four weeks yes. ago that uh, was the 1947 Tune Fest. Yes, we sang uh, the town choir of Los Altos and some soloists uh, sang uh, songs that uh, f dipping into that 1947 hit parade right. list and sang other things like Heartaches and Peg of My Heart and Near You and we ended the, the program with Now is the Hour which is kind of a, a tearful song of people going away and coming back and it was uh -huh. very successful. Now, we, had, we showed one slide of Bob Hope and, and you mentioned some of the other entertainers like Fred Allen and uh, I, I guess uh, well, Jack Benny and Fibber Jack McGee Benny. and Molly, they were, they were all on radio, and television was just getting started. In 1947, believe it or not, there were only 16 hours of network programming on television nationally, mm -hmm. just 16 hours a week. And so you're, if you had a television set, which most people didn't have, you could only, you could only turn it on for 16 hours. Wouldn't that be wonderful today? <laughs> today we've got so many channels and so many opportunities, but uh, television was just beginning then, and... Uh, um, I think radio my was family uh, was one of the first families to get a t TV set, and I think it was 1948 or 49. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was, you know, hard, there's, there were very few people who, yeah. who owned TV sets at the, uh, at the end of the 40s. Mm -hmm. uh, it just really started to um, become popular, I think, right. in the 50s. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, I think we can uh, continue now. Yeah, um, we'll go back and talk a little bit now about what was going on in Los Altos. We talked about what's going on in the world. What was happening in, in Los, Los Altos, Altos in 1947? So we can look at that now. This first picture is a, uh, the, the front page of the Los Altos News. There was a very successful newspaper, a weekly newspaper being published in 1947. It was uh, locally owned and was full of very interesting stories, very well written, we, I think, looking at it, full of ads, and very much a local publication. Clint's Ice Cream, a, a fixture in our town, was opened in 1947. We're just going to look at some things that happened in 1947. Mm. It was sold later, and the building still exists. It is now Los Altos Hardware, and you can see the ice cream uh, cone up above. This big home up in Los Altos Hill, Morgan Manor, was very much in the news back in 1947, and we'll come back to that in a minute to talk about why that was. It was being sold to a cult, and uh, they tried to stop that, and the people largely responsible for stopping that sale uh, were the Duvenecks, who are shown here uh, at their hidden villa Josephine ranch. Josephine and, uh, and Frank. And Frank, yeah. Duvenec. They were uh, great communitarians. They developed this hidden villa property and then it gave the property eventually to the county or to the city anyway, made it into a nonprofit camp and it still is in business. But Josephine Duvenek was very concerned that, that in 1947 about what was happening with that big house. I think we we'll stop actually on that, uh, on that, on that point though before we go on okay. uh, to um, the other slides, Paul, um, because um, I think this is important to kind of come back and sort of rest on, you know, the fact that this uh, this very important property, Morgan Manor, was going to be sold, and mm -hmm. Josephine Duvenek actually moving in. Mm -hmm. So, uh, this uh, there was racism in 1947. Well, yes, what had happened is that an offer had been made to purchase this incredible big home, which was built back in the 20s, um, and it was called Morgan Manor. It had been a residence, and then it had been a school, and it had been a residence. And then now again, it was privately owned in 1947 by a woman named Gypsy Buys, B-U-Y-S, and her husband. And they were going to sell it and move to Beverly Hills and to do whatever. They lived there by themselves. They had no children. And the man who was offering to buy it was a man named Father Devine, who was a cult leader from back in the Midwest in Detroit. And he is setting up throughout the world heavens related to this this religious grouping that he had, and he was he wanted to buy this building, and it would become one of the heavens. It does look a little heavenly, but uh, <laughs> it was uh, not very appropriate. I uh, thought a lot of people, and so a group of people here in Los Altos and what is now Los Altos Hills, banded together to to buy this. So to prevent him from doing it, that same group of people tried to get a movement uh, throughout this, our cities, our towns, uh, to get every property owner to put a clause in their 
uh, in their deed that they would never sell to a minority person. Oh, unbelievable. And it was, that was in 1947. Seven. Well, Josephine Duvenek and a few others got to work and they formed the Fair Play Committee of Los Altos and they prevailed and, and put an end to all that nonsense and knew, was part of, of Josephine New, Duvenek's uh, Great work. legacy. Yes, throughout our city and uh, uh, it was just yeah. one more thing she did for this community. It's amazing. She yeah. was such an important person. Um, but uh, people were having fun too in I Yes, they were. We should go back to the slides okay, and we'll talk a little bit about go back to Adobe Creek then. Lodge which was a place to swim and play. It was opened in 1947 and survived for quite a few years and became co rather controversial. In 1947, you could call up this number and take a town taxi <laughs> wow, anywhere in town because there weren't very many cars yet. Mm -hmm. uh, and I say about this one, yes, Virginia, there really was an Aunt Jemina, and guess what? She came to Los Altos in 1947 and visited Food City, one of the Food City, one of the food stores in town. The train station and the train tracks coming through here gave a, a reason for the depot garage to use this kind of advertising. They had Amazing. They ran this, a series of pictures like this of cars being smashed by trains to suggest that you better get your brakes fixed or <laughs> this could happen to you. This is a picture of the graduating class of 1940-something uh, at the, uh, not 47, but in any case at the San Antonio School. And it was in that climate that this person named David McKenzie started the town crier. So he was the first um, publisher. And he was the first founding publisher. And there's the first copy of the town crier. We might stop there for just a mm -hmm. minute and yeah, talk a little bit about to that. Yeah, stop there because, uh, Paul, you've actually brought that uh, first copy, which is really right. exciting. Right. We had a slide see. made so you could see it a little clearer on the, on the uh, tube. But I, I wanted to, you to see this. This is the very first issue of the town crier, volume one, number one. This is the only copy I know of that exists. It's mostly ads on the inside, ads on the back cover. It's just eight and a half by 11 piece of paper folded in half. This is the very first issue of the town crier, Amazing. which later grew into, 50 years later, is a publication of this size. And we look at this at, at my office all the time and sort of chuckle about, you know, from little acorns, great oaks grow. And Congratulations. This is, an this is quite, a, quite a feat. Well, of course, it, we did. <laughs> I inherited it in a sense when we purchased this. The, the newspaper had grown to, you know, way, well beyond this. What was very significant about this, I asked Dave McKenzie, the founder, one day, what, why he started this in the face of a strong competitor. There already was this weekly paper called the Los Altos News. And I said, now, why did you start this little newspaper? And he said very simply, well, because I needed the money, and I guess that's one reason that people get into business. But really, there was a bigger motivation, I know, than that. He was very interested in the community, and this newspaper grew into, uh, as it grew, and we'll go back to some slides and show the kinds mm -hmm. of things that Dave McKenzie covered with this newspaper. By 1966, the Los Altos News, which had been a successful paper, was out of business. And I, I believe that one of the reasons is Dave McKenzie found a formula. For one thing, he published this bulletin board, which was very popular over the years, and it was just ads for anything from lawnmowers to cars for sale. Here are some shots of people that appeared in the paper. That was, that's Mrs. David Packard in the center. Uh, the Great Snow of 1962 was featured in the town crier. This picture, some of you may remember who are looking at this. The rotary tree that was planted down on the uh, yeah, Main and State Street became very controversial in later years, but was very popular with the citizens. This is the site of the library. These three ladies are sitting out there in the orchard in, 19, uh, in the early 1960s, plotting how they could turn this into a library, and the library we have is there now. The museum, the History House Museum, is this farmhouse that in 19, whatever it was, 1970, mm -hmm. had not become yet the history house and the train did not survive very long. By 1962, the train the trains dwindled down, and by 1964, were gone. And Foothill Expressway took their place. We put in this picture of the Olympic track coach, uh, who was from Los Altos, and his name uh, was Peyton Jordan. And in 1968, he was very successful in bringing the U.S. Uh, track team home with a lot of gold medals in Mexico City. Those you might remember. The most controversial thing probably in Los Altos for many, many, many years was where to put the freeway. And this is an early diagram of where the freeway might go. 
which was right down through the middle of town almost, down Foothill Expressway, and fortunately it ended up a little further away. A shot of the pet parade in the early days. The oh, pet that's parade wonderful. started 50 <laughs> years. That's also is 50 years old this year, the pet parade. The much longed for and missed theater on Main Street. There are thoughts of bringing something back like that. This is one of the last shots of the San Antonio School on uh, San Antonio Road, which was later take, uh, had to be removed because it was not earthquake proof. This shot of we're sitting pretty close to where this man is sitting. Yes. Uh, this is the site of Foothill College, and that's Dr. Calvin Flint, who had the dream of a college on, on that property, and it came on later. Town Crier in the, those days sponsored a New Year's Eve run, and there are thoughts of bringing that back. Right. Well, that's, uh, and then, oh, that's Alan Cranston. Alan Cranston was a Los Alton, and this is one of his many visits back to Los Altos, which were covered in uh, the town crier. Here he's visiting with Roy Lave, who was then mayor of Los Altos. And that was on the 25th anniversary of this, the incorporation of Los Altos. Okay, well, let's stop there. Um, uh, and I just wanted to ask you some questions about, I know you picked out some highlights from those years. Um, uh, what did they coincide, do you think, with what was happening nationally, you know, in terms of growth and uh, I mean, we show the snowstorm. I mean, snowstorms happen in Minnesota yes, a lot. Yes, they do. <laughs> they sure do. But they and don't uh, happen in Los Angeles, no, so that, was a, that would be considered that a big news unique. story. Yes, it was unique. I think that probably the genius of small weekly hometown papers is their focus on local news that is not covered by any, any other paper. And that's the mission we preserve today for this newspaper is to, to uh, talk about the PTA and the Boy Scouts and all the and local sports and so on, things that aren't touched on by the national media. Today we have so many sources of, of national information on television and the news, other uh, newspapers, the, the dailies, and now the internet is another source. And so we think we have a unique niche still to feel, which that newspaper, the town crier, felt, filled all those years of, of looking at, you know, showing pictures, showing what's going on in the, to families and neighbors in, in the community. So now I want to have uh, you enter the scene because um, five years ago you and your wife Liz decided to <coughs> purchase the town crier because it was in danger really of closing and, and, and uh, ending, which meant that we wouldn't have had any kind of town newspaper, mm -hmm. uh, which would have been um, really very detrimental to the town because I yeah. think a, a newspaper gives a town an identity. Mm -hmm. uh, and but without that, uh, I think Los Altos would have lost a lot. Why did, I mean, I just want you quickly to answer why you and Liz decided to take this up, because it well, certainly uh, is almost a labor of love, isn't it? Well, it is uh, in many ways, but at the same time, it was, it's been my life to publish, and I was publishing magazines, as you mentioned earlier. I think when the opportunity came to purchase this, we made an offer. It was owned by the Chicago Tribune. There have been five absentee owners of the town crier in the last 50 years. Once Dave McKenzie sold it, it was passed on from company to company who ran it as a business and as a profit-making enterprise, and it wasn't very profitable for them. And the last, when the Chicago Tribune owned it, it became totally unprofitable, and they owned a whole string of these papers. They put them all up for sale, and so we bid on it, and uh, we sometimes think we lost the bid because we got it. And, uh, <laughs> But on the other hand, uh, it's been a real uh, wonderful experience to take the paper and to keep building it and causing it to grow. They actually shut it down on March uh, 12, 1993. It was sort of Black Friday to all the town crier staff because the town crier, I mean, the Chicago Tribune literally came in with packing boxes and said, be out of here at 12 o'clock, we're closing the paper. Oh. And within 24 hours, we'd negotiated the purchase of it to, to take it over and keep it going. We got the next Wednesday paper out right on schedule. We didn't miss a click. And part of that was because of the incredible uh, talent we have uh, on our staff That's that right. we were able to do so that. So let's bring up that slide, the town crier rescued. Yes, and well, it was, you, a, you it was a pretty adventurous day. We had five magazines we were publishing at that time, plus the newspaper. After we bought it, we uh, were able to uh, purchase the building where the town crier is located, and we've remodeled it, and many of you have perhaps seen this building now on Main Street, which is the home of the town crier and a bakery. We're delighted with the building. It's given us a whole new way to work. Some other changes we've made, we've 
changed the logo from what it had been over the years to the kind of official early English look, which most newspapers like the New York Times and the LA Times have and so on. We started the Town Crier Index. This is 40 stocks of companies whose executives live in Los Altos and Los Altos Hills, and we track those stocks week by week. We started a, a Los Alton of the Year program, and the first one was Lar Lawrence Chu of, of Chef Chu's Restaurant. He was the first Los Alton of the Year, sort of like the Time Magazine Man of the Year. Marge Bruno was the Los Alton of the Year the next year. And then this past year, we uh, elected uh, Dick Henning uh, of Foothill College, who heads the Celebrity Series. And the concept of the uh, Los Alton of the Year is this is a person who, in the judgment of our staff, we believe, we believe created the most goodwill for our community in the past year or years. These are uh, a, a, a shot of some of the past covers of the town crier, and you can see the transition of logos. And today, of course, it's that old English look that I showed you earlier. The shot is our building, and Bruce Barton, the current editor, is sitting on the Tuck Shepherd bench outside the, the offices. Tuck Shepherd was the editor of the town crier for many years and is much beloved by people who knew her. That's a great shot. Well, I want to thank you, Paul, uh, very much for joining us tonight. I, as usual, we, we run out of time before we run out of questions, <laughs> but I hope that you'll come back many more thank times you. and visit us on the History Show. And want to uh, thank uh, the viewers for uh, watching the History Show, and I hope that you enjoyed our 50th anniversary special on the Los Altos Town Crier, and I hope you uh, join us the next time.